Here's a Hasselblad, guys. Uh, so we're gonna talk about cameras this week because we have talked about face and we've talked about you know how I work with people a little bit and the features and all the little tidbits of information. But let's get into cameras a little bit. So this is my trusty steed. This thing is my H3D22 that uh, Hasselblad gave to me in 2007. And you can see I my nose wore off the, the paint on this from being smushed against it. And actually there was some sort of electricity thing here that screwed up my nose, so I stopped touching the camera. So um, my new Hasselblad doesn't have any of that going on. And um, But anyway, why do we choose one camera over another? Here's a phase one IQ250 that I've been shooting with recently, which I'm very much enjoying. And here is a Canon 5D Mark III that I've been photographing with as well. I was shooting, uh, I be, when I got into modeling, I was modeling and I was working with all these photographers and every photographer that I worked with shot a medium format camera. All the top guys. So it was either back then the biggest, the most predominant one that I probably photographed with the most was the Mamiya RZ67. Um, and then other people use the Pentax 6.7. Uh, a lot of people use the Mamiya 645 and the Contax 645. So when I picked up a camera, I got the Mamiya 645. That was my first weapon of choice uh, because it was the cheaper end of the line, end of the spectrum, and it got me into photography. I wanted to be a pro. I thought all the pros are using this. Why wouldn't I use that? That was film days. Plus, not to mention, digital wasn't even around back then. There was no even thought of, thought of digital. So fast forward four years, my career's going great. I'm taking headshots up the wazoo. I'm shooting a medium format. I should have brought it out. The Contax 645. I moved from the Mamiya to the Contax, which I still have. I love that camera. And I wanted to go, what was happening is color was turning to black and white. All the headshots were in black and white. It was changing to color and I was shooting color film and I was processing black and white myself. So I was getting my color film process at the lab and then printing color. And I was like, it'd be so much easier if I just went digital. At the time in 2004, this and this did not equate. There is no way a DSLR could produce an image that this could produce in 2004. And the images that my first digital back produced were the same as the images that this digital back produces because I upgraded and I know, and they're beautiful and insanely good, in 2004. That back is still phenomenal. If you can get an Imacon 132C um, inexpensively, you will be taking amazing images right off the bat. A DSLR back then could not hold up. Just wasn't gonna hold up. Wasn't good, wasn't even close. Was probably about the same as what an iPhone can do now. That's basically the equivalent, maybe. Uh, maybe even worse, I bet you it was worse than that. Anyway, as the years progress, what happened? These cameras moved slowly, slow. They were slow to get better. This thing's got more bells and whistles, and now, finally, this is a CMOS sensor, so I can go up in ISO. But what did these do? These went like a rocket ship out of, like crazy, and got better and better and better and better and better. So, you can now, do anything you want with these and you do not need these. I don't want to be focused on gear too much because I think you can get a headshot with whatever you're working with. As you get better, as you gain income, as you have money to spend, look, if you, if you photographers your hobby, you want to spend money on it, by all means, buy yourself one of these if you got the income, you know? But this camera can totally do it. The cheaper end of the line of the Canons or Nikons can totally do it and you can get it done, all right? Now, let's talk a little bit about ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. Very basic stuff. When I was shooting with this camera, this camera does not go above 200 ISO. Will not go above 200 ISO without getting muddy and just being a mess. So 200 ISO is the max, all right? I started shooting with my butt on a windowsill at 200 ISO and I was getting all this blur and stuff like that. I was at a 60th of a second, I was all the way open, and being all the way open on, on, the, on the lens, you're, this was with my Imacom when I started back then. So I finally went to a tripod, and then I found the KinoFlow lights. For those of you that don't know that, we're gonna show you the KinoFlows as we go, and most of you know that I 
that I've recently sh been shooting with Kino Flows and working on another line of my own lighting to, to upgrade that as well. But I had to shoot at 200 ISO. That was my limit. With this bad boy, I am so happy because now I can go to 6400 ISO. Clean. Clean. 3200 is really clean. 6400 is fairly clean. It looks, but, but before I couldn't go above 200. So I was limited. With DSLRs, you can go up to what? 20,000 or something like that? How, how high can you go clean on this? Probably definitely to 6400. So you have to decide first, where are we putting our ISO? And how much depth of field do you want? And how much movement does your subject have? And are you shooting strobe or are you shooting daylight? Let me just tell you what my, my settings always were with this camera. For years and years and years, nothing changed. 200 ISO, f6.3, 160th of a second. That was what I shot. So some of my images you could see have blur in them when people get laughing and stuff. That's because I was at a 60th of a second. Now, higher ISO, what has changed? I now have a higher ISO. I still want to keep my aperture open because I like the shallow depth of field. I always focus on the front eye and let the ears go out of focus shallow depth of field. So I want to keep the depth of field fairly shallow. So usually be around f7.1, f8 on this camera. And I'm at 400 ISO, which gets me up to 1 1 25th of a second, which now people freeze a lot easier. It's easier for me, but that's where I keep my settings on this. On this one, every lens behaves differently. So you have to decide what you want to do. Now the sky's the limit on this. I could put it anywhere I want. It depends how much I want that depth of field. It's all depth of field for, for me for ISO and also movement. So this one I shoot it at 100 ISO because I can open up this lens a little bit more in order to get the depth of field a little shallower. All right, and you could play with that. Um, I would say 100 ISO, you, this lens goes to 2.8. So I would fiddle with it and decide where I want it to get it similar to the look that I want uh, with my images. But I would shoot this at 2.8 on 100 ISO and uh, I would say probably around at 2.8 you probably can be at 1 125th of a second, 1 160th of a second, something like that. Depending on your lighting, you're, if you're shooting strobe the numbers are going to change. But if you want to create that shallow depth of field you're going to have to be low, uh, low ISO, all right? And you're going to have to test each lens behaves differently, so you're going to have to work on that. That's camera basics for today, guys. And we'll get into it more in the following weeks. So thanks for listening. Guys, if you like this video, you're absolutely going to love what I have going on over at the Headshot Crew. It's an absolute smorgasbord of material just like this that I've been working on for the last 10 years. So click the link below, check it out, and do not forget to subscribe to this channel. I got stuff coming out just for you.